Hello, everyone. I'm Rick Page. I'm really excited to uh, welcome all of you to this um, special event. This is our fourth annual celebration of gender equity in medicine and sciences. Um, it's especially uh, uh, meaningful that we have um, people visiting from the Zoom world, where it allows me to hear my voice somehow in a little bit of a delay. But other than that, I'm really glad you all are here. I'm also really glad to, to acknowledge an attendee who, who behind the scenes is at just about all of the events the Gender Equity Steering Committee puts forth, and that's our own Provost Patty Prelock. Welcome, Provost Prelock. Good to see you in person and to have you here. The Gender Equity Steering Committee has done tremendous and important work over the last four years. They didn't let the pandemic stop them. As a matter of fact, they kept going throughout the pandemic. And I really wanna commend them for their efforts ongoing. And it's nice to see representatives here in person today. Uh, we went kind of uh, forward in the community in our gender equity initiative uh, back in September, 2019, initially with a town hall, which showcased our community's commitment to the struggle to achieve gender equity in medicine and science. And then our inaugural celebration uh, was in March, 2020. And that was the last public LCOM event for a year and a half. Uh, and it's so great to be together now and to enhance the in-person event with the several hundred I know who are in the Zoom world uh, joining us today. Um, the Gender Equity Steering Committee has, has brought talent, hard work, and uh, real commitment to the Gender Equity Education Series that I personally have enjoyed over the last three years, exploring the work of building a more just, equal, diverse, and inclusive environment. Today's session continues in that tradition. I'm so glad that we're welcoming Diana Lautenberger from the AAMC. You'll hear more about her in just a few minutes from, um, from uh, Ann Doherty. Um, I do want to recognize the members of the community, community who are um, receiving awards today. And these are the awardees, but there were dozens of others who were nominated and uh, should also be celebrated for their efforts in terms of gender equity. Um, all of this work would not be possible if it weren't put forward by the committees and organizations that we have in our college, the Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, of course, the Dean's Advisory Committee on Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, and especially our Gender Equity Steering Committee. And I want to acknowledge Ann Doherty, uh, Associate Professor of Obstetrics, Gynecology and Reproductive Sciences, and the Director of the Gender Equity Effort within our Office of DEI. She's brought just exceptional energy, talent, insight, to bear on issues of gender equity. And it's really, it's really um, been a testament to her commitment um, that this has been such a successful series. And with that, it's really my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Doherty and uh, acknowledge her as she takes us through the rest of today's presentation and then the awards. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Doherty. Thank you, Dean Page, as always, for your allyship and continued commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion at the Lerner College of Medicine. Um, it's meaning, deeply meaningful work, and I'm glad to have leadership on our side. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the fourth annual Lerner College of Medicine Celebration of Gender Equity in Medicine and Science. And as Dean Page mentioned, this is the first in-person celebration since March of 2020. And when the pandemic took hold, the gender equity initiative was really in its infancy. Um, but we, as we grew, we just embraced the challenges that were in front of us. The gender equity education series pivoted to an online format um, and it allowed folks from across our campus, um, such as Provost Prelock, um, to join us and also across our health network. And we were able to do this over lunch and everyone was able to be part of the conversation, this important conversation that we were having. 
in recognition then of the women faculty who were yearning for community and connection during a period of isolation and not just isolation, but really significant work and home stress, we created the Women in Medicine and Science Peer Leadership Group, which is co-led by myself and Dr. Bridget Mariquin. And we're now in the third six month iteration of that group. Our faculty, staff, and students continue to do significant and impactful equity and inclusion work, which we honor at the celebration annually. And it's always my pleasure um, to have the honorees with us and to hear about their work. Including today, 20 faculty, staff, and students have received gender equity honors, including one Lifetime Achievement Award. And the honorees and the nominees are truly an outstanding group. Here at LCOM, we're making great strides in increasing representation of women in leadership positions. And we should be proud that 31% of our chairs presently are women, and this is compared to 23% nationally. And we've just welcomed our new Senior Associate Dean for Research, who's here, there she is, Dr. Kate Tracy in the back. And with her addition, women make up the majority in senior leadership from deans, senior associate deans and associate deans. And we should be proud of that work that we've done. But I also ask us and challenge us not to sit on that and to think about who is not at our increasingly diverse leadership table. Notably missing are our colleagues of color, those from the LGBTQ community, those from who identify as having a disability. And we will achieve excellence when everyone is at the table and is heard. And with focused intention, I truly believe that this community can do that. The conversation we're having through the Gender Equity Initiative and other equity and inclusion programming throughout the institution is critical groundwork. Coming together as we're doing right now to honor faculty, staff, and students who are doing amazing equity-minded work is critical groundwork. So let's stay in this move towards equity, though it's uncomfortable at times, and let us continue to push ourselves in accordance with our college values, professionalism, diversity, equity, and inclusion, excellence, and advocacy. And let us come together as we're doing right now and celebrate our successes. Some notes about our presentation today before we get started. This is a hybrid session, it's being recorded. Um, you can access the recording from the ODEI library, video library in a couple of days. Um, if you're online, um, there'll be a, a link to the video library as well as a link to the program um, in the chat. There's also programs throughout the uh, room here. Um, there's also closed captioning available online and there's a link in the chat for that as well. And then there's a QR code here, which will um, bring you to a place where you can subscribe to our listserv if you wanna be updated on gender equity events. So now I get to introduce our speaker. We're so pleased to have Ms. Diana Lautenberger as our keynote speaker this afternoon. I first heard Ms. Lautenberger speak at the group on women in medicine and science at the AAMC when our gender equity initiative was just an idea. And I was truly impacted by the transformative lens that she used to talk about gender equity. She wasn't simply listing statistics and talking about more mentorship for women, all of which are very important. She talked about how to advance women into positions that could truly affect systemic change. And I was inspired. And when she accepted our invitation to speak, I was, could not have been more pleased. So Diana Lautenberger manages the AAMC gender equity portfolio as the director for gender equity initiatives. Her goal is to integrate gender equity approaches across the association's mission and work. The gender equity portfolio includes research, education, and projects to promote equitable working environments, as well as developing resources for marginalized populations in academic medicine. 
Examples of the current projects include the women of, women of color and intersectionality, the gendered impact of the pandemic, salary equity and sexual harassment in academic medicine. And those are all resources that we use here in our DEI work. The gender equity portfolio takes an intersectional and gender expansive approach to addressing gender equity issues in higher education and STEM fields. Ms. Lautenberger also serves as a faculty member for AAMC's leadership development seminars for early and mid-career women, as well as a work stream lead for creating a safe and inclusive environment in AAMC's strategic plan. Ms. Lautenberger holds a master's in art education with a focus on curriculum development and creative thinking as a driver of equity and a solution to address systemic oppression. She's part of several organizations in the DC area who use artistic expression to explore concepts of racism, sexism, and social justice. And now please join me in welcoming Diana Lautenberger to the podium. Slides, if I touch it, the person is right. Um, let me just. Um, is there the presenter view? No, it's okay. Thanks, Curtis. While we're getting that set up, um, I'll just say hi, everyone. How great is it to be back in person? It is just fantastic to see your faces. Normally, I'm on Zoom. Um, talking to a blank screen, people, you know, well, people are eating. I was going to say people are normally having their lunch, but that's happening here. Um, I really have to thank you for the warm weather you provided just for me, for my soft California heart. I don't think I'm the one that brought in the snow. It wasn't me. This is my first time to Vermont. So I fully, yeah, I'm really excited. I am really excited to be here. I want to see a moose. I want to have something maple. Is that not a thing? Is that a stereotype? All right. I'm putting that in the stereotype box. Um, but in all seriousness, I'm really, really excited to be here. It's great to just um, talk with people in person and um, share our ideas. I'm really hoping that we can have a generative conversation. Um, so a little bit about what we're going to be doing today. Um, when we had our planning call, just to talk about what do you want me to talk about? I got lots of ideas. What do we want to cover? Um, Anna chair, Dr. Doherty had shared that um, you've, you've kind of done the whole describing the problem, a lot of data. What else can we really uncover? And so as we were exploring some of these ideas in our conversation, we really started talking about some of these ongoing myths that we have about gender equity work, what that means, what that looks like, and how that really applies to systems as opposed to individual people. So we knew that that was something that we wanted to cover. That really requires us to really describe and be explicit about dominant culture. And we'll talk about what that actually means, but calling dominant culture out, calling it into the space, describing the, the adjectives, the words, the feelings that come along with dominant culture. We can't fight oppression if we aren't actually gonna talk about the forces that oppress. And then how does that translate to the institution? These kind of heady academic terms, you know, I, I am not a physician, I'm not a scientist. Obviously my background is in education and in gender studies. So how does that actually apply to the organization, to the institution? And so what we're talking a lot about now in our gender equity work um, is really not just leadership positions, but power positions. How do we put people from marginalized backgrounds and historically underserved backgrounds into positions that have institutional power? And so that's really the perspective that we come at this from today. And I'll just start with a, a quick story. You know, I've been at the WMC for, I don't really remember. I think it's 13 years. I'll have to double check, but it's it's been too long. I started when I was in high school, obviously. Um, and you know, a lot of my early work was doing exactly what Dr. Jordy was describing of the numbers, the representation, um, and this move to thinking about dominant culture, ways of being, norms and things that are normative. Um, there was uh, just back in the before times when we would actually go into the office, one of my really good friends, he's um, a cisgender white man. That identity has um, importance to the story. We're out getting a sandwich. I ordered his, my sandwich before he ordered his. We're sitting around, we're waiting. I realize, you know, we're standing in front of that wall of chips that's at every sandwich place. Like, oh, I forgot to get chips. Um, and we're standing there. He gets his. Mine's taking a little bit longer. We're waiting, we're waiting. It's like 10 minutes, 12 minutes go by. I was like, oh my gosh, where's my sandwich? 
and now I really want some chips, but I've been standing here. I don't want to get back in line. And he looks at me and he's like, you want those chips? Like, yeah. Like, okay. He walks up to the counter, just skips the line and is like, um, my friend has been waiting for her sandwich here for like 15 minutes. Um, and we would like a bag of chips. I'm actually going to take two bags of chips just because we've been waiting here for so long. And the person behind the counter just looks at him and says, okay. And I had no idea that you could use your privilege to just steal chips. I was like, this was like a game changer for me. And it was, and I, I have his permission. He's my best friend. I had his permission to share this story, but it was really um, an eye-opening experience, even though I had been experiencing these things my whole life, of how people walk through the world very differently. It's not that I wasn't smart enough to come up with that idea or that he's, you know, reading the game or reading the rules easier. It's that my experience as a queer woman has told me I don't allow that. That space is not allowed for me. I don't get to have that privilege. And so we have to start thinking about the connecting the dots between all of these terms that I'm sure folks are reading lots of articles, lots of books, all of these terms are getting thrown around. And I like to start here because oftentimes I have, I do a lot of traveling around to institutions and medical schools and people say, Diana, we are so focused on diversity, equity, inclusion. Do you have like the cliff notes or like five bullet points? Like how do we do equity and inclusion? How do we get there? There's gotta be some quick, easy way that we can pop that into our strategic plan. Well, it's actually a really long process <laughs> and it requires us to do really deep, intentional, personal work so that our institutions can go through a parallel process of deep, intentional, personal work. And that starts with just recognizing that not all the time and not everyone, but often we are actually in environments of direct and intentional exclusion and harm. We have to just name that. And so that's gonna be a lot of the foundation of what we're gonna talk about today. But only when we recognize that, when we talk about that we are actively in these environments where people feel excluded and are being regularly harmed, can we then understand and talk about our unconscious biases, how those lead us to behave in ways or say things that are microaggressive, how that reifies and really perpetuates dominant culture. And again, we'll talk about those um, definitions in just a minute how we can interrupt that process through allyship. And I've heard a lot of people talking about allyship that so um, just in the few hours that I've been here. And when we have active, not performative allies, but authentic allies, we can create these cultures of respect, dignity, worth, well-being, And that's really how we get to inclusion belonging and lots of other things. Um, but that's how I think about this path is that it is intentional work. It does take time. I don't think it takes as long as it's been taking but it has to be part of these regular conversations that we're having. All right, I'm not gonna do a lot of data, I promise, but just to level set, um, and this graphic is actually a little bit old because this is from our 2019 report on the state of women in academic medicine, but just to remind folks that we are doing a pretty good job of getting diverse individuals, um, people who identify as women into medical school. There's great interest there. When we look at along the pathway, to leadership, into faculty positions, those numbers just continue to drop off and drop off. And um, the department chair and dean numbers are both uh, higher than that now, but they're still less than a quarter, less than 25%. And so I'm constantly looking at the representation as part of my job in terms of leadership positions. And I think a lot of folks are pretty familiar with some of the uh, dean level data that we have um, sometimes people say, we're doing great with assistant deans. You know, they're 50%, 50-50. Those positions we all know come with a lot of responsibility and not very many uh, decision-making responsibilities or budget or actual power. And we're going to talk about what power means. And then when we actually break it down into the functional areas of the dean's office of where um, women might be, they're heavily concentrated in certain offices. And these are offices that have a lot of people work, a lot of relational management, not a lot of budget, not a lot of institutional influence. So I just put those up there as kind of our grounding principles. Um, and again, we could do an entire presentation on all of the data on just some of these areas. We could spend the entire talk, we could spend the entire day talking about these studies. We know that they're there, they're pretty well documented. 
But I really use this list as a reminder of all the phenomena we'll be discussing throughout the talk. Um, and we know that there is lots of data showing how people are paid inequ inequitably, face harassment, face microaggressions, are promoted slower, your abilities are doubted. And so it's important for us to keep those experiences in our minds when we talk about dominant culture. All right, so what we're really gonna be talking about today is shifting this focus of gender equity um, and not coming from this deficit mindset. We're really coming from a systems mindset. So again, not, I've spent so much time, I'm actually kind of tired of talking about women, if I'm really honest. We talk so much about the deficits of women and the deficits of other marginalized communities. We need to start talking about dominant culture and the forces the very intentional forces that we have in our institutions that are there for a reason, they're not accidental, um, that really keep people back. So we're gonna talk about um, and debunk some gender equity narratives, some cultural narratives that we have. Again, identify some of those power structures and then really thinking about the breaking down those barriers to power positions in our institutions and sponsoring diverse folks into those positions. So, you know, I have this whole other talk that's myth about women in the workplace that we're kind of evolving from there. So this is really going on that, you know, myths that we have about women don't wanna be leaders and all these types of things. They choose careers first. Um, and these are very similar to that, um, but it's really looking more at this systems level. What are these general ideas that we might have about gender equity that may or may not be true? So the first, and this was just in our, we were having a, a meeting beforehand, just kind of chatting over coffee about what does gender equity even mean? And I think when people hear gender equity, they think it means women. It's tips for women, how women can get ahead, better negotiating. And that somehow that has nothing to do with men, that men and people who identify as men are just these passive observers of gender equity. When in reality, what we're trying to do is get all genders and all folks to think about these harmful ways of being. Because gender norms actually hurt men too. When we think about the ways in which that men are expected to behave, to lead, there's this whole crisis I think that people have probably read about in terms of boys and young men going into higher education, not going into certain professions, because we've kind of left men out of this conversation of, what kind of gender norms we have. And really gender equity and inclusion is about eliminating these harmful norms. Equity is about correcting past injustices, of course, but that process really benefits everyone. And so rather than having men think about themselves as observers of gender equity or passive um, participants of, well, I'm gonna be a supporter, how can we include everyone in this conversation and understanding that all of the gender norms that we have are actually really harmful? I think this idea of the zero sum game um, is really, really important because there's really often this barrier when I go to institutions and talk about equity and what that means. And what people hear is if we're making things more equitable, if they've been like this and we're trying to make things more equitable, then that means I'm losing something. And that is just a purely outdated mode of thinking. That, that is assuming there is a finite pie that if I get more slices of pie, then you get less. When actually equity is about baking many, many more pies. Everybody gets a pie in this process. But we have to understand where that thinking comes from. And it's a white supremacist mode of thinking. We'll talk about that a little bit later of that we have this either or zero sum methodology of going about our lives, about our workplaces, about how we're promoting people is that if you're getting something, then that means I'm definitely not getting something. And I think it's really about this, this fear of loss, um, loss of status, loss of um, you know in, even employment, some kind of income opportunities. We have to actually face this fear of loss that people might have and get them to understand it's not about loss, but it's about what we'll all gain when that happens. And I think something that happens quite often when we talk about privilege as a concept, which can be a very strange word, I think, for a lot of people. So we also call it social advantage. 
Um, when you have been in a place where you've had privilege, equity processes feel like discrimination. And I think that we have, um, we're seeing that right now with all the admissions cases that are going on when people are trying to have um, race conscious admissions that people are, it's a little bit shocking that people think that there is um, discrimination happening against white applicants because of this process. <laughs> it has nothing to do with that. And I, and I think that that's how we, um, there's a huge backlash that happens anytime we have any kind of equity movement or social justice movement, there is that backlash saying, now I'm being discriminated against when that's actually not true. It's just, that's what um, equity looks and feels like. Now this might be a new one for some folks. Um, and it's one that I'm really interested in exploring more of this idea that women lead a certain way and that we need the type of leadership that only women can provide. This idea that when you read these articles about women in leadership and it's always kind of, there's been like a little ting in the back of my mind of this feels a little funny, I'm not really sure why, which it's great to provide examples of women who are successful leaders. And when we're making these blanket statements about women are, we need women as leaders because they have these skills. We do a couple of harmful things. First of all, we continue to perpetuate this, uh, this us versus them kind of notion, which again, a lot of gender equity work, the way in which it's been proposed, the way in which we talk about gender equity creates this us versus them mentality. And human beings, if you've gone through an unconscious bias training, which I'm sure many of you have, we know that we are designed to define our group. We love our group and we love saying, this is my group and that's your, that's your group and we do not play together. That's kind of how our brain, we'll, we'll come back and do an unconscious bias training um, next because it's a whole thing. And so it, A, it continues this us versus them mentality, but B, and more importantly, it actually perpetuates these gender stereotypes that we have. It actually strengthens group-based identity and these ideas that it is normative to be one way or another. And so then that actually punishes people when they violate those gender norms. That's what, that's what really controls a lot of our system is these gender norms. So if I am someone who identifies as a woman and I lead in a way that is not traditional feminine leadership, I get socially punished for that. And on the same token, men who lead in a way that we've kind of defined as more feminine, maybe more communicative, more collaborative, Ooh, I don't know what happened there. Um, they also get socially punished, right? And so when we keep people in these gender lanes, we're continuing to perpetuate the, these ideas of harmful dominant culture. And so this idea that, you know, women are the, the way that women lead is the key to everything. Many women do lead that way, but it's a problem when it becomes normative because we're continuing to have those gender norms. And then this idea um, about really the system and the whole idea of fixing the women versus fixing the system. And really trying to, that if you just try hard enough, if you mold yourself enough, if you do enough mentoring about how to act, behave, speak, use the right phrases in this system, we shave down your sides so that you become a round peg into a square hole, you'll succeed. And if you're not succeeding, it's because you haven't done that. And so it's this idea, uh, and this connects to this belief that it's about women's choices of why they haven't succeeded. Um, that women choose somehow to make less <laughs> or that we're choosing a career or a specialty that is not paid as much um, or that we're not advancing. This whole idea of, you know, women don't negotiate, women don't do this, women don't choose their careers first. When we really need to be describing, systems don't support these types of things. Systems don't allow for different ways of being, different family structures. And so it's really about starting to look at that dominant culture that we've established that really dictates and, and requires everyone perform in a certain way. Um, and more importantly, if you don't perform in that certain way, you'll actually be punished for it. It's not like this neutral thing of, if you're not gonna um, align to the dominant culture, then it's just a neutral impact. It's actually a negative impact when you are not behaving um, in that type of way. 
So these are just some of the, the kind of myths about gender equity generally that I'm starting to observe and starting to notice and starting to think about um, in terms of how we actually move forward. Um, and so really this next chapter that we think about gender equity, and I really want to stop focusing on the oppressed and really start focusing more on the forces that oppress and bringing that into light. And so that calls us to think about um, dominant culture. Um, and you know, we were also having this conversation before about bringing our authentic selves to work. Um, and what is it that prevents us from bringing those authentic selves to work? Mm -hmm. Dominant culture, ways of being that are rewarded both socially and professionally in our environments. And so there's, long, there's a long definition. And then if you don't wanna read all that, there's a short definition for you. It's basically these ideas of groups based on some kind of social identity they wield more power in organizations and importantly impose those norms on others and we have very subtle and overt ways of understanding and noticing ah that that seems to be the way that people act here ah yes that got the attention of someone these are also subtle things these don't have to be you know large overt things but our dominant culture ways of being is how things are done here. That's our organizational culture about how quickly we respond to email, who gets to say something in a meeting, who gets listened to, all of these small parts of our organization um, is really how those dominant culture pieces come out. And we'll talk about some examples. And so in a way we can think about how dominant culture reproduces certain people in our environments. In the United States, only 16% of men are over six feet. I thought it was more than that. That seemed very low to me. But, and the reason that it seems low to me is because who do we see in media and leadership positions? 16% of US men are over six feet tall. Among Fortune 500 CEOs, it's 60%. And that is a very real example of a culture that will reproduce, of what we have defined, what we have thought of as successful, um, competent, charismatic, who is a leader, what does a leader look like? Similarly, 25 of Fortune 500 CEOs are women, 25. This is from a couple of years ago. So I might actually, I need to update this stat just to make sure. So 25, 23 are just named John. And it's the same idea that women, men, gen generally in gender categories are 50-50. This is not on accident. This is because we are reproducing because of ways of being, the way that people look like. Um, we're continuing to have these people and pull these people actually in, not to say that folks aren't actually accomplished and actually doing things, absolutely, but this is how we get these situations. And so one type of dominant culture that we can actually describe um, is masculinity culture. Um, Jennifer Brudal, if you're interested, has, this is her concept of masculinity contest culture, which I think is just really fascinating. Um, I should also note that we have to layer on top of this and be cognizant of white supremacy culture, which has definitely influenced what we think about when we think about masculinity contest culture. But these are some of the norms of what we think about in terms of masculinity. Um, contest culture, this idea of showing no weakness, showing no doubt. I absolutely know the answer. I'm not going to um, say, you know, I don't know. I'm going to go back to the, the to the textbook and see. There's lots of studies um, that have been done about people who double check their work. We don't believe them. <laughs> if you see a physician and they actually go back and look at uh, their textbook about maybe a prescription or something, um, patients will actually trust them less. And that's because we have this false equivalency of confidence equals competence in this country. This idea of putting work first, family is second, family is outside of work. These things do not overlap at all. That is a very United States context cultural um, thing, which we'll absolutely talk about in a minute why that is. That's not an accident either, but that you're always putting work first, you know, and everything else can come secondary to that. We do have this um, kind of hyper-focus on, on strength, both physically 
Uh, mentally, this kind of idea of stamina, that you're going to work long hours. If we think about resident culture, if we think about the things that we're asking um, physicians to do, that you can just be on call forever, that you can be working, you know, 16 hours in a row. This idea of strength and stamina. And even in the United States, the emphasis that we put on athletes, this kind of athletic stamina. And then finally, this idea of ruthless competition, this dog, kind of dog eat dog. And that's kind of where that either or zero sum comes from is I'm gonna try and not just get some of the resources, I'm gonna try and get all the resources as much as I possibly can. So this is this concept that Jennifer Brudal talks about. Okay, that's fine, MCC, I get it, but masculinity conscious culture. What does that have to do with the organization? What is it? Okay, great, there are some hyper-masculine folks walking around. What does that have to do with the organization? Well, it leads to these functional or dysfunctional ways rather of the organization working where we've got potentially toxic leaders. I think we found a, a lot of this in our um, work on sexual harassment of institutions not really wanting to do anything because they're bringing in millions of dollars, you know? And so this becomes this toxic force in the institution um, that we allow to stay there. We know all of the data around bullying and identity-based harassment that um, there is, again, this, I'm going to make sure that we keep the culture this way through bullying, through the words that I use, through harassing behavior, this overly heterosexist climate, um, and very low psychological safety. And, and that, I think, of becoming a pretty big buzzword of, of, at least what I'm hearing at schools, of needing to create that climate and culture of psychological safety for people to actually have these conversations. If you try and get everyone into a room and say, okay, what's going on? What's bugging you? Well, if, you have, if we haven't created the psychological safety to do that, we can't. And so ultimately, how does that come full circle and harm at the individual level for everyone? And again, this is where we really want gender equity to be about all genders. It leads to burnout when you're in this um, type of environment. You have low dedication. We're losing people, high turnover. When people, again, going back to that dark slide at the very beginning um, that had all of the different behaviors that people experience. If I'm coming to work every day and I'm experiencing that, I'm out. I could probably go somewhere else and not have to deal with that all the time. And we know that it has direct correlations um, with poor mental and physical health. Now, again, I'll just um, do a little bit of an emotional check. This is not saying that men are bad. And a lot of times when we give this talk, a lot of feelings can come up for folks. And that's, that's what this work requires. Vulnerability, complex emotions, which we don't really make a lot of space for in medicine or higher education, which academic medicine, we're right at the apex of these two hierarchical, scary um, organizational cultures. And so this is not saying that men are bad. We're describing the characteristics and behaviors that are currently valued, even though we, you wouldn't probably say they're valued. If they're allowed, they're valued, they're fine. And it is the way they're allowable. That is the way that their culture is working. And so some folks might be thinking, well, I don't really identify with those behaviors. <laughs> you know, um, I'm not a masculine, overly masculine monster. Um, these can also come out in subtle ways. Um, and so in, in many ways, we have this idea that because we don't see the overt stuff, that somehow gender bias and bias in general has somehow gone away. And this was a great study from a few years ago um, talk from HBR or Harvard B Business Review talking about how subtle bias can actually be more harmful sometimes. Not to say that overt bias is not, but because when we think about all the stuff that's now illegal that used to be legal, um, sexual harassment and ways of being, uh, it was very easy to separate that from yourself. If someone's, not that it's again, not harmful, but someone being overly sexually harassing to me, that has nothing to do with me. They're just being a creep. The type of bias that we have now, because that stuff is largely illegal, is really aimed more at your competence, really aimed more at you deserving to be here. Do you have a place here? Why are you even here? How did you get in? And in many ways, that can be much more harmful. And so it's this idea of where I think we've gotten now, where it's not socially or legally acceptable to be overtly sexist, but we have this. Thing called benevolent sexism 
And being equitable, gender equity, being supporters, being allies does not mean being nice to women or marginalized people. And I think that's where we've gotten um, a, a lot of the time is, well, I'll just be really nice to marginalized people. That is not equity. And we'll talk about a little bit of, about how that um, comes out. But we've got this idea of benevolent sexism of kind of, I am gonna be a supporter, but still in this very paternalistic way where I'm still gonna reward you for staying in your gender norm lane. I'm gonna support you as a woman, as long as you still do all of these things that I know as dominant culture signals that you are aligning with that gender. And we have this relationship in that way. Now, when you add that with all the hostile sexism that we know still exists, we have this hierarchy enhancing legitimizing result of these myths that actually are, again, are strengthening group-based inequality. Going back to the idea that women are, have leadership skills that we can only get from women. We're strengthening and digging our heels into these particular ways of being, which means when someone, again, doesn't act like that or perform like that, we punish them. And so another result of this, um, when we think about that result. And when we have these dominant cultures, this means that marginalized groups are always going to be fighting for resources. We have traditionally taken this path of trying to always get to the status of white men. It's not about changing systems. Typically in our equity and inclusion efforts, it's about how do I get there? How do I do that? How do I get paid that? How do I get to the Dean level? where if we're always trying to measure our idea of success with measuring equivalency with white men, we're always gonna be competing with one another. And this is at the heart why it's about dismantling dominant culture systems. Because in the end, these are not separate isms. All oppression is connected. Addressing dominant culture is most important for all groups. And it all stems from the same thing. While there are differences, obviously, of racism, sexism, homophobia, those do need dedicated paths and work. And there are differences. But they all come from the same desire to dominate in our dominant cultures. And we're not working against different systems. We're not fighting against different systems. And so calling these things out and we'll talk about ways to interrogate that is really important. And so it's about anti-oppression. That's the goal. Now we have to raise, um, we have to talk about intersectionality when we talk about all oppression being connected. And we raise this um, and we raise all the dominant culture stuff because our liberation is tied up with others. My liberation in my particular identities is completely tied up with someone with multiple marginalized identities. And we can only all get liberated when all of us are liberated. And so I have to be focused on other people getting free. And again, that's part of that imperative, again, for men too, of the gender norms are probably not working out for men either. <laughs> we just don't know it. We haven't allowed that space. And so often we ask our colleagues to come to work um, for people who have multiply marginalized identities. Um, we ask them to come to work and pick which identity you wanna come with today because we're not really recognizing the full complexity of who we are. And we know that intersectionality is really about um, how are they are not, our, our oppressions are not um, compounding or additive. They're, transformative. I can't just say woman, queer person, you know, all of these other things. Um, it's that it actually changes our experience of those folks. And so we have to think about that um, institutionally as well. All right, how does this come up in power structures, in our institutions? Um, and we're starting again to talk about power, because I think leadership has become a little um, vague. It's become a little watered down. There's, you know, and, and it's true, there are leaders in lots of different levels. Um, but to me, it seems like what we really need to be focusing on is really positions of power. 
there are some traditional academic leadership paths. I can't take credit for this schematic. My friend, uh, Dr. Uh, Archie Chatterjee, who's the Dean at Rosalind Franklin, um, she came up with this. It's a pretty simple path to becoming a Dean, wouldn't you agree, in terms of the pathways that we have. Um, but this is typically how we think about academic medicine and those pathways to leadership. You can do either or of these, then you can go here. Um, when we are actually needing to think about, not everyone can be a dean. There's only 156 medical schools. Sometimes it keeps changing, so you forget. There's only 156 medical schools, and so there can only be 156 medical school deans. There's lots of other opportunities that we should be talking about. And so many of these um, positions in terms of power roles, many of these are not new. These have been around. These are part of higher education, but they are becoming newly powerful in how academic medicine and healthcare is changing in higher education. And we've been doing some activities at different professional development groups, um, just querying and asking people from different schools, what are the most powerful positions at your institutions? Um, and thinking about who holds which kinds of power when you think about these positions and thinking about the top five leaders at your organization. Who are those people? Who are those folks? And so what we're really seeing is this importance um, on the health system. Not that academic leadership and positions are not important. There is also this emerging um, importance in the health system roles. And so if these emerging power roles are happening in the health system, we got some work to do. <laughs> um, when we look at the data of where we are in terms of hospital C-suites, hospital CEOs, this becomes incredibly important um, because my supposition, and this is all just kind of emerging and happening, is that we are recreating the exact same inequities in the health system side that we're still recovering from and have been recovering from for decades. We're doing the same thing over there. And as that power starts to move toward the health system, and I realize every institution is different in how affiliated you are with your system, um, we're seeing this trend and we're still behind. So that requires us to have some new skills. We gotta, we have to start talking about new ways of being a leader. Again, this idea of women lead a certain way and, and men lead a certain way. We need to actually have the conversation, what do we want leaders to look like and lead like? What are the skills that it takes, regardless of our attachment to a gender? And so these have been some of our traditional leadership skills of things we think you need to have under your belt when you're going up for leadership. There's a whole lot of other new stuff that's going on, a whole lot of other new things. And this is something especially we're thinking about for our programs around women. Women's leadership development programs don't usually have legal training, finance training, business acumen, managerial stuff. We're starting to put that stuff in because these are the new skills that we'll need and, and lots of interpersonal and political skills. We also have to talk about different kinds of power. Um, and this is just one model. You just Google types of power. You'll get a ton of different models. This is just one that I, um, I just liked the graphic because it was colorful. Um, but they're pretty similar across these different models. And it's important when we do leadership development training, when we do professional development training, as we talk about power, we're also talking about different types of power and how to develop those skills to have that type of power and where it is in the organization. Um, and so, you know, we don't need to go through a lot of this, but I think that it's important for us to recognize the differences in say legitimate power, which is really, you have power because you have a position, you're in a place because of your title or your role, you actually have power. You can also have referent power. You can have reward power. I have, I have the ability to give resources or take resources away. That's the type of power also. And again, thinking about getting diverse folks into these types of positions that have these power abilities is key. To simplify all of the different types of power, there are positional types of power. This comes with, you know, the formal power to do something, um, or again, that rewarding or coercive power. But we also are, again, these new skills that we need in leadership, there's personal power, people who have connections, informal types of power, ability to motivate other people, ability to build coalitions. That's another type of power as well. That 
should be looked at just as importantly. And so I, um, this is a great activity that I saw a couple of years ago, a couple of years ago. What year is it even? This says 2022. I don't even know. Um, that is really interesting, especially to get marginalized folks who have maybe dipped a toe and maybe have some kind of position to think about how are all of these things that you do at the institution, how are they working for you? Or are they working for others? And so this is a personal reflection activity to just think about all of these things. And this is not everything that you're doing, obviously, but to really start to think about does this give me power or does this give someone else power? Or more, more importantly, does it give someone else power over you because of that? And so that becomes a reflective activity in terms of thinking about where to go. And so how do we think about these sources of power that we've had and the forces that use that power to oppress? There are lots of um, modes and models of oppression. Um, and I know oppression can be kind of a scary word and people don't really understand it. And um, there, if you want to Google it, the four eyes of oppression is another way to think about it. But when we think about oppression, it happens personally, interpersonally, institutionally, and then systemically. And I think sometimes, and then there's an ideological oppression that kind of happens on the outside, culturally, the ideas that we have. Um, and so sometimes I think folks can get a, a little confused. How does an institution oppress people? I know, you know, how does a, an, an entire organization? Um, well, we start at the very bottom of interpersonal power oppression. That could be just the type of lived consciousness that we hold in the institution, the microaggressions that might happen, that disciplinary source of power, that's management, how we enforce the rules of the game, who we allow more space or we give more forgiveness to, or that we say has potential to do something. And then there's this more structural, um, the institutional structures that really exclude and keep people out. Um, and this is Patricia Hill Collins, who's written a ton about this, um, if you wanna get more into thinking about this. And then what we're really trying to describe is that more hegemonic source of power, that cultural, these ideologies that we hold um, as a culture. All right, so how do we actually start? Where do we go from here? This is super depressing. How do we how do we come out of this? Where do we go from here? My goal is not to depress people for the rest of the day. It's about opening our eyes and thinking about systems and structures in different ways. Um, and so there isn't a simple solution, um, but we can have these difficult, intentional conversations um, that are quite literally changing how we do things. We can also be honest about why we haven't been doing these things. Again, going back to this idea of bias and that we as human beings are designed for comfort. Once we find comfort and something that's working for us, we're probably going to plant ourselves there and stay there even if we consciously want something better, even if we consciously know that equity and inclusion is the right thing to do in our institutions, we get comfortable. And so once we recognize that comfort that gives us some grace and space to do things differently. But that begs some really critical questions for those of us who do have privileged identities, like being white, being a man, um, cisgendered, able-bodied, you know, if we are saying we want to dismantle systems, that means we actually have to change. And if we're changing things to make it more equitable, that means we have to actually redistribute power. So we have to be willing to ask ourselves, for those of us who have identities of privilege, what power are we willing to give up? What does that look like? Or are we just going to be comfortable for the rest of our lives? And the giving up of power means letting parts of the old system go. What it tangibly looks like to dismantle systems of power is not to continue to value and reward the old ways of being, right? Um, this is a pretty well-known framework from Okun and Jones describing the characteristics of white supremacy culture. Now, a lot of these probably sound pretty familiar, probably normative. 
how many of these do we take for granted as the right way of doing things, especially in medicine and higher education? Perfectionism, sense of urgency, only one right way, either or thinking, fear of open conflict. These things are so ingrained in the way that we live and work, particularly in the United States, that they just seem normal to us. And so it's letting parts of this system really go. And so it is not about band-aiding our system. Um, it is quite literally changing it. Um, and we hear a lot from people of like, the system is broken, the system is broken. The system isn't broken. Systems are designed to get the exact result that they're produced or that they're designed around. And so in that way, we have to completely change the system. If we think about um, you know, a factory that was designed by right-handed people, all of the buttons are on the right side, all the levers, all the stair rail holdings, uh, the buttons to the elevator, absolutely everything that makes you successful in that factory is on the right side. You bring a left-handed person in. Are they not as intelligent? Are they not as talented? Do they not have other ideas? But you could see how they're not gonna be as successful as someone who's right-handed because the system wasn't designed for them. And that's our current way of thinking. And so it is changing from this type of system that we are trying to, again, fit everyone into. There's a reason we don't have childcare as part of our working environment. There's a reason that we have certain procedures for how people get into leadership, where it's just get a bunch of people in a room and yeah, they look good. I get a good feeling from them. These are not on accident. These are intentional because they were designed by people who had one particular experience. And so it's changing that system that really fits multiple people into the system. And we can do that through conversation. Again, we don't make a lot of space for vulnerability and complex emotions in medicine. And this is difficult stuff. This is hard stuff. And we have to have those open emotional conversations. And more than that, have we ever really had a conversation around some of these organizational norms about what professional behavior looks like, about what a good employee looks like? Because if we haven't, then we're relying on dominant culture to fill in those pieces about what is really being rewarded. Why is certain type of service work not promotable or you can't put it um, or expect it to contribute to promotion and, um, and other types of service you can? What behaviors do we consider uncomfortable? You know, bringing conflict out into the open or being a little bit more argumentative. Um, those are cultural norms that we have that if somebody doesn't, does do that, we're, they are seen as being deviant. And then also, thinking about how this comes out as coded language all the time. There's lots of ter tom terms talking about, there's lots of people talking about microaggressions. That's one thing. There are also ways in which we continue to perpetuate our dominant cultures through the, the phrases that we use. What is professional appearance or dress? There's a lot of talk about hair right now and how certain types of hair are not professional. According to who? According to what system? Um, I want to work in a comfortable environment. Oh, do I have to watch everything I say now? Do I have to be, you know, sanitized environment? These are coded words and ways that we keep our dominant culture alive. And so again, asking questions and creating discussion and conversation that will directly break these dominant culture cycles. And so we can, we can have these discussions at the local level, in your team, at a departmental level. These are open conversations that we should be talking about, not when something actually happens or somebody doesn't get promoted. Then it's, you know, the usual conversation after the, the meeting of, well, we all know why. If we have these conversations out in the open, what kind of skills do we expect our future leaders to have? What does effective and successful leadership look like? What's our process for search and recruitment? How do we advertise our positions? Was it even posted? Do we just go with our network of 10 people that we know? And how do we hold people accountable when we don't live our values? And the accountability piece is huge. A lot of this has been written about. Um, 
there, if people are familiar with the NSF's advance grant, those are grants that go out to institutions to work directly on gender equity. Um, and there are a couple of authors who went to all those institutions and interviewed them and found out and documented more about their work. So this is a great compendium of just institutional practices of what people are doing. So they outlined basically these four institutional structures that really serve as barriers to women. These four, the biased evaluation processes, unwelcoming workplaces, employment structures, and inequitable opportunities, and then solutions, institutional solutions for what people are doing. And we can also rely on people's lived experiences. And this is a website called the Everyday Sexism Project where anybody can go in and describe the sexism that you experience on your campus. Um, and it's there are have been different institutional models where um, for allyship groups that have men in them, they will actually do projects of having men read these out. Because it might be something or an experience you've never considered before. I never knew someone had that experience at work. And so what that might look like um, in that moment is actually understanding people's lived experiences. There are lots of things that organizations can do. I think the work that's going on here has already um, demonstrated a lot of good practices and really growing in that area of like being on the right track of, of um, addressing the right things. Um, and there are some great things that we know will really help. Tracking data and being really specific about our data, not just representational data, but hiring, promotion, attrition, who's leaving. We know mentorship and sponsorship programs are imp important. I will make another plug for allyship groups for men. Um, there is a program out of Ohio State uh, called Advocates and Allies, and that is a group, a year-long facilitated group just for men to get together, talk about all this stuff. I'm sure people have questions or I'm sure people have feelings. Get together, actually have that conversation because that can be really um, helpful. And then de-biasing our systems. Our, our brains are just too biased and subjective to actually not have bias come into all of the many processes that we have um, in higher education and academic medicine. So the more we can de-bias those processes, we don't actually have to worry about our bias coming in. And we do have to be hopeful. I, again, I don't want to completely uh, demoralize everyone. I don't want anyone to say, I just need to go home now. I'm so depressed. It's not supposed to be the most depressing talk of the year. Um, I wouldn't be doing this work if I wasn't hopeful. And I think this is a snapshot of one of your recent medical school classes. At least that's what Google told me. Um, but I have to be hopeful. Even all of this negative, really difficult stuff, I am optimistic because we are making progress, um, especially when we think about um, the award winners that we have here today, the work that we've talked about already that's going on, the commitment from leadership to equity and inclusion. We have to be hopeful because I, really, I wouldn't just be go traveling around to all these institutions if I thought it was pointless. And so the work never ends, but I think we're on the right track. And so it's these types of conversations where we're moving the needle a little bit forward um, and getting a little bit uncomfortable. So just as a last final moment, um, and I'd love to hear some of your questions, but also just reminding us about the value that diversity brings and how we don't make space for diverse, diversity in our institutions. We can't measure everyone by the same thing because we bring such different talents and experiences uh, to the workplace all the time. We've got lots of fun resources and reports, which I'll talk about some other time. I'm happy to send any of these resources out to you. Um, and I really wanna thank everyone for your attention and happy to hear some questions. Oh, yeah. Don't ask me about the mic either. There we go. Yeah, I got it. Everyone <laughs> Is this on? Uh, no, maybe. Yes. Oh, just a little delay. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Diana, for coming and talking to us, giving us some really, um, uh, some big challenges, I think, in terms of acknowledging dominant culture and the role um, that it has in harming folks in the environment and um, helping us to push forward. We have time for a couple of questions. We don't have a lot of time, but also I would offer that after the award ceremony, which is going to be right after this, 
um, we'll be, stay in the room yeah. um, until about two o'clock. Um, so there will be more time, but any questions here, either on Zoom, um, we've got the Q&A function. You can also go right to the awards if you want to, and we can do it later. This is, we got a couple I'm of questions. Flex I'm flexible. Bob. Now on Tuesday, um, the, the board of trustees of New College in Florida voted to dismantle the Dean of the Pi um, office. Yeah. Uh, the, the board has been searching for authoritative people appointed by Governor Ron DeSantis. Mm -hmm. Not to know what's going to happen with Florida trying to stay in Florida. Yeah. So, um, I'm curious how we can go about this. You know, uh, there's the anti-drag, there's the anti-gay, there's the anti-trans things that are happening in Florida. Do you see that spreading elsewhere and what yes. can we do to stop it? Yeah, I mean, I think it's 300 bill anti-LGBT um, and trans bills that have been put in place since just last summer. Um, it's a huge problem. And the backlash, this always happens, I think, the backlash as soon as, and again, this goes back to as soon as you're asking for equity, people feel like something's being taken away from them. And then the backlash really comes in. Um, so we're seeing it across many states, uh, especially WMC, we're keeping our eye on it really closely because other states, are, and we're kind of sifting out into these two camps, right? The institutions that think it's really important and maybe states or institutions that maybe the institution thinks it's important, but there are other state leaders that are making different decisions. I think the more that we can show the benefits of diversity and what it brings um, and how everyone is benefiting from our institutions, sometimes it really comes down to um, the bottom line. <laughs> Unfortunately, I wish we didn't still have to make the business case for diversity, but I think when we can show and be vocal about the benefit that it brings to the organization, that can help. Beyond that, it's, you know, really grassroots activism because this stuff is happening at a really, really high level. Um, but I've had to, I've been working with people in Florida who to design their DEI programs because they literally can't say certain words. And there's a lot being cussed that they can't make anyone uncomfortable. It's, at that point, it's, you know, something at a much higher level needs to, to happen. But thank you for bringing that into the room. And I think I am going to move us to our award ceremony. So I apologize for folks that Absolutely. have questions. Please, <laughs> please stick around though. Um, the award ceremony, and we're going to have someone come and help us with our PowerPoint. We're switching it out. We just have to switch our. So this is the fourth year now that we're um, bestowing honors for gender equity in medicine and science, and we're so happy to do this. Um, today, we're going to start a new tradition. Today, we're going to start a new tradition, which is that past honorees will be presenting the awards um, alongside Dean Page and Ms. Lautenberger and myself. Um, so Dr. Joanna Conant is a um, assistant professor of pathology and laboratory medicine. Um, she's also a member of the Gender Equity Steering Committee, co-chair of the Education and Professional Development Working Group. And it's also her birthday today. And she was last year's recipient of the Rising Star Award. Um, Dr. Beth Kirkpatrick, um, is the chair of uh, molecular biology, no, microbiology and molecular genetics. Um, she is a professor of medicine and um, was the 2022 recipient of the Outstanding Achievement in Medicine and Science Award. And Dr. Isabel Desjardins is professor of psychiatry, also our chief medical officer from the uh, UVM Medical Center and was the 2022 recipient of the Polaris Award for Outstanding Mentorship. And I'm honored to have them come up to the podium to present awards. Is this still on over here? Ah, yes, it is. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Doherty. So the first award is the Gender Equity Champion Award. And now I need to, ha ha, wait. Perfect, excellent. So equity and inclusion are inextric inextricably linked to the UVM Lerner College of Medicine's mission of education, research, and patient care. In recognition of that mission, many college faculty, staff, students, and trainees 
are actively engaged in championing, championing equity and inclusion in multiple local, regional, and global settings. This award recognizes Larner College of Medicine community, community members, faculty, staff, and students who have demonstrated outstanding commitment and service to the advancement of women and gender diverse populations beyond the scope of their job, areas of research, or training. And this year, due to exceptional nominations, both a faculty and a student award are being bestowed. Our first recipient uh, of this award is Dr. Bridget Mariquin. Congratulations, Bridget. Uh, Dr. Mariquin is nominated both by both her past and her present chair. They know that Dr. Mariquin is a passionate advocate and champion for the promotion, success, and career happiness for women in academic medicine. Particularly, particularly academic anesthesiology, as well as healthcare more broadly. As an example, Dr. Mariquin collaborated with two UVM undergraduates in the development of, of VT Reach, which is a health careers outreach program targeted pre-college and college students who might be interested in health careers. This is available on VT Reach's YouTube channel, um, and these sessions are accessible to many students who may not otherwise know these healthcare options exist. And this breaks barriers for women and underrepresented people. Uh, at our College of Medicine, Dr. Mariquin co-leads the Women in Medicine and Science Peer Leadership Group with a goal to foster the development of women faculty leaders through peer-to-peer -peer mentoring, networking, and collaboration. And in the Department of Anesthesiology, she developed a grand rounds reciprocity with Dartmouth and Albany to increase opportunities for faculty, particularly junior and women faculty, to present regionally. Her scholarly projects include two studies devoted to investigating gender equity in grand round speakers at UVM and advancement of women in anesthesiology into leadership positions, the latter of which she turned into a master's thesis project involving a multi-site study. Dr. Mariquin's commitment to promoting gender equity in medicine is strong. She's a fierce, tireless advocate for women in medicine and beyond. Congratulations, Dr. Mariquin. Uh, thank you all, um, specifically um, Dean Page and um, Dr. Ann Doherty for her fearless commitment to gender equity um, here at the Larner College of Medicine. Um, I only have two minutes, so hardly enough time to thank all of the the mentors, the sponsors, the friends, um, the champions, the cheerleaders in my life. Um, but specifically, I want to thank Melissa. I want to thank Natalie. I want to thank Anne. I want to thank Becky and Emily. Um, and of course, my my three daughters. Um, I've been blessed with three daughters who are now teenagers. So every day they are my welcomed, sometimes unexpected challenge, um, but also my inspiration. We have a plaque in our kitchen that says, um, here's to strong women. May we know them. I know them. May we be them. Thank you. I guess I am, I am one. And may we raise them, right? May we raise them, not only the ones we're related to, but those of us in our, in our learning communities and our, and our healthcare communities. Um, and I, and I absolutely have to thank my husband, my partner in raising, um, women, uh, um, for 20 plus years. Cause I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here in my career. Um, and I certainly wouldn't be, um, in, in this position, accepting this board. He's the biggest cheerleader and the biggest he for she that I know. So thank you all. it on the side here. Okay, here we go. Uh, the second Gender Equity Champion Award, hold on a second, is not that one. <laughs> here we go, here we go. Okay, the second <laughs> uh, Gender Equity Champion Award for 2023 goes to Nina Feinberg, Elcom Class of 2023. Uh, congratulations, Nina. <laughs> 
Wait, what? Okay, so her nominator of fellow medical students speaks to her advocacy for women and LGBTQ plus community members. And at a time when the rights for these groups are in flux nationally, Nina has worked tirelessly with local youth through Outright Vermont, uh, as well as directly with local high schools to provide support and a sense of community through sponsored events. They've partnered with the Department of Family Medicine to develop an LGBTQ plus out patient clinical care elective to help address the gap in clinical education regarding this community at the medical school level, a need they helped identify through an original research study also uh, co-sponsored through the Department of Medicine, through the Department of Family Medicine, I'm sorry. However, um, her work um, advocating for vulnerable populations started prior to their time at El LCOM as a medical advocate for survivors of rape in the greater Boston area, along with educating college students about sexual health and consent as an undergraduate at Brandeis University. And despite not yet starting their career as an OBGYN, Nina has already had a long history of passionate and dedicated uh, commitment to increasing access and quality of healthcare to women and gender minorities. So uh, Nina's talents and enthusiasm are indicators of the fantastic accomplish accomplishment we foresee in her future as a compassionate and gender inclusive physician. So congratulations, Nina. I tend to get flustered, so I wrote some things down. Some distinguished guests, faculty, and staff of the Larner College of Medicine and the University of Vermont Medical Center, I am truly honored to be receiving the Gender Equity in Medicine and Shines Champion Award, and I am humbled by the incredible and deserving nominees joining us today. I'm fighting the urge to make a self-deprecating joke fueled by unrelenting imposter syndrome, but I really stand before you with confidence and with gratitude. Um, I think that my brief but really exciting time here at Alcom has been really graciously summarized, and I'm just truly appreciative of all of the support and these remarks. I'm especially immensely grateful for the guidance of Dr. Kathy Mariani of the Family Medicine Department. The newly existing LGBTQ curriculum would not exist without her. And I would also like to extend my deepest gratitude to Brad Blansky, my fellow fourth year medical student. We collaborated on these projects together and he will undoubtedly continue to change the face of medicine through advocacy and through inclusion. And I also always like to thank the woman and her wife who shielded me from homophobic remarks from a stranger at my very first pride parade nearly a decade ago. I never saw you again, but you continue to inspire me to use my lived identity to uplift others. It was an honor to be nominated. and I'm so excited about my the next phase of my career and to continue advocating for gender and sexual minorities for the rest of my practice. There's a lot of work to be done and it is so inspiring to see so many people take the initiative to do it. So thank you. Congratulations again. Okay, the next award is the Gender Equity Outstanding Achievement in Medicine and Science Award. This award is given to a woman or gender diverse faculty member within the Larner College of Medicine who has demonstrated outstanding achievement in medicine and science through research, education, or service. Additionally, this individual must be recognized at a national and or international level for their scientific and medical achievements and serve as a role model to women or gender diverse community members at the Larner College of Medicine. Finally, awardees will have demonstrated a commitment to advancing equity and inclusion for women and gender diverse community members. The 2023 Gender Equity Outstanding Achievement in Medicine and Science Award this year goes to Dr. Stacy Sigmund. Dr. Sigmund, uh, Dr. Sigmund. <laughs> uh, Dr. Sigmund uh, was nominated by her chair. She is, a highly she is highly recognized for her work in the area of substance use disorders, 
She's conducted research in this area for almost three decades and has obtained more than $25 million in funding as primary investigator, including a $10 million HRSA grant to establish the Vermont Center on Rural Addiction. We do need that. She's published more than 100 peer-reviewed manuscripts and journals, such as the New England Journal of Medicine, JAMA, The Lancet, and she's president of the College of Problems of Drug Dependence within the American Psychological Association. Since 2004, she's directed Vermont's first and largest opioid treatment clinic. And from a gender equity standpoint, she's supervised six women to their PhDs, although, although along with serving more than more, many more other women for their thesis work, many of whom have gone on to successful research careers themselves. Uh, Dr. Sigmund developed an APA undergraduate scholarship to provide undergraduate psychology majors, many of them are women, to attend their national conference. She's also served on the Maternal Mortality Review Board for the Department of Health in Vermont. And she's an exceptional teacher and scholar who's been recognized at the national and international level and who consistently champions the need for equity and inclusion in the care of some of the most vulnerable individuals, including those with substance use disorders. Dr. Sigmund has and continues to be an exceptional contributor to the Co College of Medicine and an exemplary candidate for this honor. And please join me in congratulating Dr. Sigmund. I too wrote down some remarks because I can no longer, I think it's early onset dementia. Uh, I'll blame, but so I um, deeply appreciate this honor and I thank the college and the Gender Equity Steering Committee for this recognition of our work. Um, I've always found scientific efforts to develop more effective treatments for addiction to be both exciting um, and rewarding. And actually the same um, very much goes to our more recent efforts to bring those treatments to underserved communities. Um, it's also the case in thinking a bit and reflecting on these awards today in our ceremony or time together. I came to realize I think there's um, likely a parallel between much of our work in the addiction medicine space and that of the Gender Equity Committee. Um, and my hope is that one day and hopefully within my lifetime, both of them will actually become no longer necessary. And that would be a, a milestone. Um, but for the meantime, I very much appreciate um, this honor today and the support of myself and my colleagues from all of our collaborators and colleagues across the College of Medicine. Thank you. Congratulations. We will now present the Polaris Award, Polaris Award for Outstanding Mentorship. Polaris, or the North Star, is anchored at due north while the remainder of the northern sky rotates around it and serves as a beacon and directional point for those finding their way on a journey. The Polaris Award honors a Larner College of Medicine faculty or staff member who provides outstanding formal or informal mentorship for Larner College of Medicine women and or gender diverse community members. The 2023 Polaris Award goes to Dr. Fran Carr. Dr. Carr is nominated by five of her past or current mentees. Her nomination statement reads, I had the privilege of performing research in Dr. Carr's lab laboratory as both an undergraduate and doctoral student for a total of seven years. In my time working under Car uh, Dr. Carr's mentorship, I gained both the skills I needed to be a well-rounded scientist and the confidence to pursue a career as an independent researcher. Dr. Carr facilitated my professional development by encouraging me to expand my skills at the lab bench, making sure I took opportunities to present my research, helping me develop a successful pre-doctoral to post-doctoral transition fellowship application and nominating me for various awards. It wasn't until late in my graduate school career that I began to appreciate just how impactful having such a supportive female mentor was for my success in graduate school and for my overall career trajectory. In my time at UVM, I observed as Dr. Carr took on several other female students who co-signed this nomination, 
and provided them with the space and support to thrive in a research environment. Just as she did for me, Dr. Carr adapted their needs and interests so that they could each find where they fit in the scientific community. She believes deeply in each of her mentees, is methodical about entrusting students with increasing responsibilities, and is an excellent role model as a successful woman in science. Each of Dr. Carr's mentees have impressive resumes of their own and have gone on to pursue either doctoral or master's degrees in biomedical sciences, public health, and medicine. Dr. Carr has perfectly embodied the criteria for this award for many years through her thoughtful guidance of her students as evidenced by her long list of successful and grateful female trainees. Please join me in congratulating Dr. Fran Carr. I didn't bring notes, so I hope I don't go on for too long. I am tremendously honored to be recognized with this important mentorship award. Um, of course, I have to thank Dr. Noelle Gillis, who is uh, kind of chief in that. I could hear her voice. And of course, Dr. Catherine Amidon, uh, Caitlin Early, who is here, as well as Lauren Cousins and Emily Wilson, and many other supportive members of our research group. I have to share with you that I recognize now that it's been more than 10 years uh, since I returned to the faculty from those years in administration. And I've had the privilege to mentor individually more than 30 undergraduate, masters, and doctoral students from diverse lifestyles, experiences, and cultures, Afghanistan, central Vermont. And uh, certainly many of these students have actually been first generation college attendees. So they all have different experiences that come to the lab and we find ways to make sure that they all fit and thrive depending on what their uh, aspirations and goals will be. And speaking of that, I am proud to say that almost all of my former students have gone on to graduate school. Some have gone on to medical school. Uh, right here at the Larna College of Medicine, in fact, all that have gone into medicine have come to LCOM. So it's quite exciting to see as well. And it's uh, quite interesting to see that uh, many of my former students have now gotten to the point that they are actually in successful roles as faculty members and leadership positions and um, universities and uh, departments of public health, as well as in the industry. It is, gives me great pleasure to stay in touch with my former students, to uh, have collaborations with my former students, and probably more importantly, to see them collaborating and communicating and supporting each other, sort of in that extended network that I hope the seeds were planted in our lab here at UVM. So in closing, I'll just say, um, I really thank my former students, my current students, uh, for this uh, taking the time and initiative to nominate me for this award. And I think they all should recognize uh, that uh, truly their success is my own reward. So thank you. The final award of the day is the Rising Star Emerging Professional Award. This award recognizes a woman or gender diverse faculty or staff member at the Larner College of Medicine who is in the earlier stage of their career and who demonstrates excellence in contributions to students, colleagues, and or the institution in the areas of gender equity and inclusion through their service, program development, teaching, research, or beyond. The awardee also shows the promise for future contributions and leadership in their field, as well as achieving goals for the advancement of diversity, equity, and inclusion. The 2023 Rising Star Award goes to Dr. Sherry Kadanga. Dr. Kadanga is nominated by three of her mentors and colleagues. 
Her nomination statements describe Dr. Kadenga's significant achievements in her clinical and research work in a trajectory which is still on a sharp increase. Here are some highlights from the nomination statements. In three years, Dr. Kadenga has developed a robust and funded research program with a special interest in women's cardiovascular health. As a director of UVMMC Cardiac Rehab Program, she recognized early on that cardiac rehabilitation was underutilized in women. She therefore developed a women-specific training program to facilitate engagement and optimize the training response. Her novel approach to cardiac rehabilitation exercise training was shown to promote promote a threefold greater increase in cardiorespiratory fitness in older women and has the potential to change cardiac rehab treatment and clinical benefits for women. These findings were recently published in the JAMA Cardiology. Dr. Kadenga serves as a mentor to female cardiology fellows and has created a curriculum for all fellows to specifically address women's cardiovascular health. She has also helped establish a Vermont chapter of the American College of Cardiology Women in Cardiology to advocate for women's cardiovascular care and engage providers and trainees interested in gender equity. Given her dedication thus far, I have no doubt that Dr. Kadenga will continue to make important contributions within the area of sex-based disparities in the treatment of cardiovascular disease, both through research and clinically, and will also serve as a shining example of a successful female clinician scientist providing support and inspiration for other women in a traditionally male-dominated field. Please join me in congratulating Dr. Sherry Kadenga. I'd like to thank the committee for this honor and this award is very meaningful in multiple ways and it was so nice to hear some of the words mentioned for those who nominated me. I went into cardiology because I wanted to really focus and promote women's cardiovascular health and I view this recognition as a one step that allows the outcome to recognize the importance of highlighting women's health and addressing these disparities and my research and education that I'm able to do would not be uh, done without the support of uh, my colleagues in the Division of Cardiology, led by Dave Schneider, as well as the VCBH COBRA, uh, led by Phil Adis, my mentor, and Dr. Steve Higgins, who've really been instrumental in supporting my ideas. And I really do hope that I can pay it forward and allow others to not only promote women's cardiovascular health, but just to be along these amazing mentors and hopefully pay back uh, in the future. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. It was such a pleasure to hear from all of our honorees today, an incredible group, and to have the community back together in person. Um, I look forward to seeing everyone at our next gender equity event, which will be um, announced, but it will be in May. Um, Steve Burns, Dr. Steve Burns, will talk about psychological safety, one of our buzzwords. Also, a QR code for to get on our listserv. Um, and have a great afternoon. Thanks for supporting gender equity.